So before I ask the authors to come out, I just wanted to read their quick bio. So first we have Naomi Hirahara, um, who has written many books about Southern California Japanese American history, most recently Terminal Island, Lost Communities of Los Angeles Harbor, co-written by Geraldine Nats. She is also a mystery writer. Her Edgar Award winning Masurai mystery series features a Japanese American gardener, Hiroshima survivor, and sometimes sleuth. <laughs> I heard that phone. <laughs> Hirahara lives in Pasadena. And second, um, co-author Heather C. Lindquist discovered a love of ex exhibit planning and writing while serving as an intern at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History and applied this experience to developing interpretive exhibits for Manzanar National Historic Site and other National Park Service's venues. She is the editor of the award-winning Children of Manzanar and is a contributing author to Freedom in My Heart, edited by Cynthia Jacobs Carter and published by the U.S. National Slavery Museum in association with National Geographic. Lindquist, Lindquist lives in Los Angeles. So please um, put your hands together and help me welcome Naomi and Heather. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming out here to the Japanese American National Museum. Um, and we want to thank especially Elizabeth Lim for coordinate, co coordinating all the logistics. So this is not our first rodeo. <laughs> Heather and I have been speaking in a, a lot of different places, ranging from Santa Monica all the way to Bainbridge Island and Seattle. I went to Chicago this weekend. And we've also um, been um, doing a lot of radio interviews about this topic. And guess what? Today is the final event for that will that Heather and I will both be par participating in. I'll be doing a final program in um, at GSA in Emeryville near Oakland next week. So you know what? We're gonna make we're gonna do our presentation, but we want a certain kind of looseness, maybe be reflection. We really want to hear from you any questions or comments or observations that you have. We want to hear them today too. How did? What are, what are Naomi and I doing up here today? We work together on the exhibits at Manzanar National Historic Site with our friend Eileen Hareki. And I came into this project, in a sense, um, through the young woman whose photo is on the Hapa Me banner. That's Harper Ullman. And her father, Christopher Ullman, was the exhibit designer at Manzanar. And I came to the project by working with him and Eileen and Naomi. And then in 2015, we had a chance to apply for a JAX grant to fund this book. And essentially, what people at Manzanar, many visitors want to know is what, what happened afterward? What, where did people go? How did they pick up the pieces? What happened after camp closed? And essentially, the book started out as a quest to answer that question for a general, a general audience. And it was the sort of brainchild of the former executive director of Manzanar History Association, Maggie Wittenberg. And um, Art Hansen, who's Professor Emer Emeritus at Cal State Fullerton, who, and who also pretty much single-handedly started the oral history program there specifically on this topic. So the vision initially was, you know, tell it through personal stories, personal narratives, and make it accessible to a general audience. And then we had to figure out how do we how do we pick from that from those stories within that. So this is the Fukuhara family. Um, Henry Fukuhara is on the right-hand side um, holding his daughter, Grace. And actually, we've been able to meet Grace a couple times, once in Torrance and once in Santa Monica. And um, so this uh, particular photo was taken in New York. Is uh, They were from Santa Monica, and then they were involved in the nursery business, and then in Manzanar and from Manzanar went to the East Coast. So how do we tell the story of, well, specifically in Manzanar at its peak, there were like 10,000 people, 11,000 people cumulatively. And of course, in all the camps, maybe, you know, 120,000 people. So how do you tell the story, you know, in a comprehensive way when you're just telling it, you know, through stories? people's stories. And we have like 50 people that we're following throughout the book. And so we decided we had to be, um, we had to be strategic 
Um, since Heather and I are both women, we wanted as many women as men, and um, we also wanted um, a variety of ex responses to both the incarceration and the resettlement, different decisions that people made. So we wanted to reflect all of that in the book, and um, through through choosing people who um, follow different paths. We also committed early on to having it be fairly highly illustrated, partly to just because we all like looking at pictures and partly because it really brings people into a more personal aspect of, of the story. Um, we were able to work with Alan Miyatake, and many of you know Toyo Miyatake took photos in camp. Uh, the family also documented their own resettlement story, their return to Los Angeles, actually the Boyle Heights neighborhood, as well as other, other people's stories. So in this photo, they're headed back down 395 to Boyle Heights, and they were able to move into their, their family home that was um, intact from the pre-war period, but they immediately opened the doors and began sharing it with, I think, about 15 other people. Um, so much so that Bob, one of the younger brothers, um, actually, yeah, Bob isn't here, um, said it's the reason he went to the army. <laughs> the home was, home was a little crowded at that point in time. <laughs> we also wanted to convey the, the feeling of this incredible diaspora that happened. And in fact, it was really the War Relocation Authority, the WRE's intention to encourage what they called, you know, preventing people from bunching up as they had pre-war. And so there was this sort of explicit uh, desire to try to um, encourage resettlement in the Rocky Mountain states, the Midwest, and the East Coast. And so this, this is just an indication of some of the locations people went to, the, the people whose stories we tell. And it's also generally representative of the broad distribution, uh, especially in the, in the 50s. And But what, what we found is that Resettlement was really incredibly unsettled. You know, people would try a city, it wouldn't work. Mom and dad would still be, brother, sister would be someplace else, maybe still back at Manzanar. You'd try a city, you'd say, you know, this one isn't so great. Don't come here, let me try something else. And so there was, a, it happened sort of in, in fits and starts. And although some people did stay um, in the East Coast and Midwest, and we'll tell some of those, those folk stories. Many ultimately did return. About a, a third of the population at Manzanar had been from LA County, and we found that many, many did return uh, in time, some decades later, as in the case of Henry Fukuhara. So because people were leaving camp as early as... Um, 1942, it's like, how do we tell the story of, um, re quote, resettlement or leaving camp? And through talking with our editor at Heyday Books, they're the ones who have, uh, they're a nonprofit publisher and they've pu um, printed this book. Um, Gail Watawa, she recommended, well, why don't you um, start it with people leaving? So we decided to start it off with the last, the quote, the last ones who were in camp. So from this photo, you can see by mid, you know, and this is months after the war officially ended, there were people still in camp. There were maybe about a thousand people, and then it dwindled to 200 people. And then finally, on the quote, last day, which was November 21st, 1945, that was the day before Thanksgiving, there was 49 people left. And um, so we decided we um, to start it off with those people. And who were these people? Many of them were older or else they just had babies. I mean, Toyo was two, but there were babies being born like in August of 1945, um, September, you know. So um, there are people who could not leave. There were people who were uh, poor, you know. They didn't have a, a, any property to go to. They didn't have any place to go to. So they were given $25 by the government and, you know, a one-way bus ticket. And, you know, they, they didn't know where that next destination would be. So one of the last ones um, was this family, um, the family of Reverend Shinjo Nagatomi. I, I don't know if Duncan Williams is still here, but he's a professor at 
USC and he's um, in religion and he's, he knows this family very well. But um, so uh, Reverend Nagatomi was the Buddhist minister in camp. They were uh, first in San Francisco, went to Assembly Center and then came here, <clears throat> came to Manzanar. So um, Reverend uh, Nagatomi just felt it was his responsibility to kind of be there you know, until the end. And he had, he and his wife had three daughters. Um, Shirley is on the left and she lives in San Jose. <clears throat> and I was able to talk to her for the book and she's been interviewed in various oral histories. And that's another thing. How do we tell the story when so many people have passed away? That's the power of oral history. And that really came in handy. So, um, as um, Shirley says here, the gates were closed after us. I still remembered the loud clang of the gate. So this is where they went. So they ended up in Gardena. They, um, the reverend was assigned to um, Gardena Buddhist Church. In September, um, it had been turned into a hostel, as many places of worship were. And um, the family, they moved into a kind of a rat-infested um, parsonage-type house, a building. But Shirley did say she was one of the lucky ones because back in the temple, there were people staying there, and it was kind of like the early days of Manzanar. There were, like, blankets placed to create um, a barrier between families. So um, in that sense, she said she was lucky. As Naomi mentioned, the housing um, shortage was critical for everybody, but especially difficult uh, for the people who are returning. And often those with sort of the, the least means had the hardest time, obviously, finding a place. The trailer homes in Burbank were one of several trailer, trailer homes in the area. This is photographed by Miyatake. And on the right is a photo of the Evergreen Hostel in Boyle Heights. And so... This, there would be both church hostels and other community hostels set up that would maybe maybe cost a dollar every day, you know, something something really affordable. I think um, the part that was most shocking to me personally, and I've mentioned this a couple times, is that I thought, okay, after resettlement, things are gonna, you know, things are gonna get better. The worst part's over, you know. Cer certainly, you know, things are gonna look up from there. And really, that we found in so many cases the opposite was true. That we're not glorifying camp in any, by any means, but the resettlement era was really challenging on so many levels. And I think that was one of the big eye-openers for me, was that things just got more difficult, whether it was financial, whether it was social, cultural, logistics, how do you pick up the pieces and go on, all in a climate of persistent racism and prejudice. Oh, just a quick note. The, the photo on the right is by this wonderful uh, photographer, Marian Palfi, whose collection is at the Center for Creative Photography in Arizona. And there's more resettlement stuff that she photographed that we couldn't get into. And we weren't actually able, in the depth of research that we did for this project, to identify people that she uh, photographed as being from Manzanars. Um, but it's definitely something that's, that's worth looking into. Her work is really sort of underrepresented in this, in this area. Just yeah, thank you. I could just see that <laughs> spilling. I, I do want to, in, in conjunction with that image, I know Christine Hayashi's here from Janum, and um, she's doing specific work about people moving back to Los Angeles. So, Kristen, wherever you are, yeah, check out the Palfi photos at, in Arizona. Um, anyway, so one of the places people came back to was Los Angeles, and it had completely transformed. So when people left little to a place like here, where we are, little Tokyo, um, there were, it, it left a void. So when um, blacks from the deep south were uh, came to Los Angeles to work in the defense industry during World War II, they faced racial covenants where, you know, you the people, because of discriminatory 
d- discriminatory laws, they couldn't move into neighborhoods. So the government kind of points to Little Tokyo. Hey, you know, coincidentally, this place is open. Why don't you move there? And it was overcrowded. Um, s- some reports say there were 25,000 people kind of squished in this area. Um, but there were, it, it, it was vibrant though culturally there were jazz clubs that had opened up all over um, little tokyo and um, the african-american newspaper the eagle here was actually very sympathetic towards japanese americans and made a, a decision not to use the racial epithet jap in their pages um and and so there was that kind of sentiment out there that was in support of the people who had lived here before. The um, politicians feared when Japanese Americans returned here, there would be a race riot, but that didn't happen. There was conflict here and there, but all in all, it was relatively smooth. And um, I think also because uh, the people who lived here were from somewhere else, um, that you know, they're more disenfranchised and they just kind of moved into other areas. Um, the person on the right is Hank Umemoto, um, and he is a farm boy from Central California, went to Manzanar. And then he and his uh, mother and um, siblings lived in Skid Row, so just south of here. So going to school, you know, after the war, he was walking over drunks and passing over brothels. But he said that was not real, really the issue, the struggle he had. It was more being accepted by the American mainstream and just like being turned away maybe at a movie theater or having to sit in a really bad place in the train. Those were the things that bothered him the most. Um, so one of the what kind of popular way stations for people was the city of Chicago. <clears throat> and actually, I just came from there. I was there this weekend to talk about this book. So uh, before World War II, there were 400 Japanese Americans living in Chicago. By 1945, there was 20,000. So just imagine that amount of growth. This photo is of Sue Kunitomi Embry, and many of us know her and um, and knew her. Um, and Sue, at that time, was living in Los Angeles, went to Manzanar. She went to Wisconsin, was beautiful there, but she couldn't find work. So she actually moved to Chicago and had a very positive experience. Um, she was assigned to work at a <clears throat> beautiful reference library called the Newberry, and I was able to visit there last year. And um, she, it was a positive experience for her to work alongside blacks and whites in an integrated environment. On the other hand, for other young people, they were unsupervised. There was like, it was Chicago, right? So there's gambling, there were a lot of temptations out there. There's actually cases, a government report cites incidents of um, abortions, babies being born out of wedlock, um, a stick-up man who had been apprehended. This is all within the Japanese American community, and even a sexual predator that was loose. So obviously, you know, the adjustment for people to be, you know, first taken away from their homes, incarcerated, and then in a totally different environment, you know, um, did have its consequences. In contrast to Chicago um, is Bainbridge Island, which before the war, it was a little bit, little bit like Terminal Island and that it's an island. It was cut off from the mainland. It was next to a strategic Navy base. So the Bainbridge Islanders were among, they were kind of the, after Terminal Islanders were uh, removed, from Terminal Island in Washington State on Bainbridge, about 227 uh, Japanese Americans were almost the test case, and that was in March, so in advance of sort of the the main group arriving at Manzanar. So unlike a place like Chicago where the population sort of changed dramatically, in a lot of ways, Bainbridge Island stands out as an exception. And as Naomi mentioned, we were just there, and we found out that it, it really is 
true that before the war, because people were friends, they were going to school together, um, the kids were growing up together, they were on the same baseball team, the Japanese-American strawberry farmers were pretty well distributed over the island, and the commu- there was community support. The editor of the Bainbridge Review, uh, Walt and um, uh, Mildred, why am I forgetting their names right now? Uh, Wood- Woodward, sorry, Woodward. Um, made a point of of keeping in touch with people after they were removed from from Bainbridge. They appointed one young guy who'd been sort of helping out at the at the newspaper who went to Manzanar their their correspondent. So they managed to keep track and remind people back home at Bainbridge, hey, here are our friends and neighbors and here's what's happening to them. They're they're doing this, they're moving to Minidoka, the men are working on the beet harvest. So there was a home to go home to in many in many instances. Um, this photo is of uh, many of you probably recognize her. She sort of became this unwitting, you know, icon of the the forced removal from Bainbridge Island. She's holding her daughter, Natalie, who's um, just about one year old at the time. And here is um, Natalie back on Bainbridge Island in the 1950s. We also wanted to find out, well, what 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 was it like? You know, you could go home, but was it really the same? And of, of course it wasn't. It was, you know, hard to reinvest in the strawberry plants, hard to find labor for, for some of the, the smaller farmers. So in many cases, um, in the case of, of Fumiko's sister, um, they did move to the mainland and um, sort of, wind down the family farm on on Bainbridge. But what was remarkable is that when there is sort of integrity to a community, it can um, make things, I guess, ameliorate things a little bit. Naomi, did you want to add to that after we were just at Bainbridge together, kind of your response to that? I think there's that iconic image of people going... On the the ferry. yeah, Yeah, and it's really amazing... I mean, we're going to talk about sites of conscience later, Mm -hmm. but it's just really powerful what people in the community decided to do. The memorial is really remarkable. If you ever can find yourself on Bainbridge Island and go to the memorial, it's really really beautiful. Um, In contrast to the sort of small family strawberry farms, small farms on Bainbridge Island is um, Seabrook, New Jersey. And actually, we have Toyo also went to Seabrook. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So we can we can put you on the spot later. Um, Seabrook um, had become the biggest supplier to the U.S. military for canned, dehydrated, and frozen foods. And who who remembers Bird's Eye brand frozen foods? Yeah. And for sure, as a kid, I wasn't getting anything labeled bird's eye. I hated vegetables, and those were particularly, you know, definitely not going to get eaten. Um, but it, Seabrook actively recruited at Manzanar. So, you know, they, they, they had become the biggest supplier. They had a labor need. And Mary um, Nagao, next to the Buick, um, was with the, the twins, Irene and Pauline, and her husband Charles was away working on the beet harvest, and Mary attended the recruitment lecture and kind of said, you know, this this is maybe as good an opportunity as any. And she pretty much delivered Charles an ultimatum. She, she got permission to go visit him in, in Idaho, and she said, we're going. If the twins and I are leaving. If you're not coming, sorry, we're out of here. So they did... Um, get to Seabrook, and they did raise their family there, and they kind of found purchase there, but they experienced systematic um, preference for Caucasians in advancement, in reaching higher management levels within Seabrook. So although they stayed in New Jersey, they didn't stay working for Seabrook. Charles went to work for a glass manufacturer, and Mary became a county clerk um, in Cumberland County. So, um, you know, even though you can kind of find purchase somewhere, the struggles the struggles continue. And Charles became very involved in the redress and reparations movement later. A lot of Nisei found themselves, the ones that um, went, into, went to colleges in the nation's interior, sometimes the only Japanese American in their school or maybe even the whole town, um, Momo Nagano, and she has a close relationship to this institution in a number of ways. And one is her daughter, Maria Kwong. Um, she re- manages the bookstore here. 
but Momo was also a master weaver and her um, textiles have been on display here as well. But anyway, uh, Momo um, got into a, a Wheaton College. This one is an all-girls school in Massachusetts. And her, her brother, Daisuke, Daisuke went to Yale. So we have a very smart family here. So Daisuke just dropped his younger sister off at the school. It was late at night. And Mo, Momo discovered that the whole dorm was awake and waiting for her because they had never seen a Japanese American before. And in typical Momo fashion, she said it was real spooky. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one of the things we wanted to do is also reflect sort of the, the range of responses and, and reactions, both during um, in camp and certainly during resettlement. And one of the ways we did that was to look at both veterans and resistors. Um, this photograph is actually just about the same day that the Reverend Nagatomi was leaving Manzanar. So this is November 21, 1945. And this is a group of several hundred people. Some were um, renunciants. Some were not US citizens because they weren't allowed to by law to become naturalized citizens. So this is a group of people who, for various sets of reasons, go to Japan, sometimes for the first time after the war. And um, we follow the story of a couple of these people. Um, one of the most kind of, I really don't have a word for it, one of the most um, astonishing stories for me actually came to us by way of Art Hansen. And it's a story of a father and son, two generations of, of uh, military veterans. On the left is Ernest in the super dappy, dapper suit. He was a lawyer, um, actually Terminal Island, and represented, I think, the Fisherman's Union. Is that right, Naomi? Uh, Fisherman's Association. Fish, and he filed the habeas corpus case. Well, the, uh, it was filed on his behalf. He immediately said, this is not right. This is when his family was, was taken to Santa Anita. He uh, was also a World War I veteran. So he, he was particularly um, appalled <laughs> at what was happening. He um, did end up at Manzanar. And his son, Edgar, on the right, was actually one of 541 babies born at Manzanar. And uh, Ernest does decide to take his family to Japan. And Edgar, the younger, grows up in Japan. And around the time of the Vietnam War, his father says, you know, you need to serve the country of your birth. You need to serve the United States. And so Edgar agrees to do that and serves in Vietnam as a medic. And then went on uh, to s remain a reserve officer. On 9-11, he's been recalled to duty. He's in the Pentagon when the Pentagon is hit. So he called on his medic training and immediately helped colleagues out of the building and uh, turned to help first responders for a period of 10 days, after which he received the um, uh, soldiers award is the highest award for non-combat bravery. So in this one generation, we have a story of service, military service. We have a story of uh, resistance. And we have um, kind of this incredible reveal of what it means to uh, be patriotic. Is it to serve? Is it to dissent? Maybe it's both in certain cases. So um, and Edgar has since gone back to Manzanar and has addressed um, student groups there talking about his experience. So one of the Nisei men who decided to serve in the military was Paul Banai. Um, he's on the left, and he was with the military intelligence service. And he, his uh, service was kind of unusual because he translated for actually um, Australian forces in places like Borneo and Indonesia. But when he came back, he was very involved with the and and later on, you might be might know this, especially if you're from the uh, South Bay. He became the first um, Japanese American assemblyman for, in the state of California, but that was much later. But anyway, when after he returned to the U.S., he was uh, one of the leaders of the veteran Nisei Veterans Association. 
And Paul had this idea, what, you know, why don't we, he went to actually a Hollywood studio and said, you should do this movie about Manzanar. And this is like in the 40s, right? And he was thinking this way. And the studio said, well, you know, we don't want to do things that are on controversial topics that won't make money. And that was in the 40s. You know, how much has things changed? Not much, unfortunately. <laughs> But what did happen was the same studio that he approached later in um, 1951 released the movie Go For Broke, um, which was on the 10442 uh, with Um, Van Johnson was, of course, the star. But they had a lot of actual soldiers who were in the movie, and one of them was Pont Bonnai. It also included Bruce Kaji, who's um, helped to start this museum here, um, Sambo Sakaguchi, who became a doctor, and um, Jerry Fujikawa, who actually kind of became a character actor, and he was in the movie Chinatown. What, uh, another thing that was really interesting about doing the book was um, realizing that so many leaders of redress and reparations had been incarcerated in Manzanar. And this is um, Sue Kunitomi um, Embry. We last saw her in Chicago. And she became one of the leaders of the Manzanar pilgrimage. And she really worked um, alongside other people to make um, Manzanar a historic site, to make that a reality. And um, so people have asked why, why, and I don't, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure why so many leaders came from Manzanar. It could be that they're originally from like Los Angeles, a big city. Um, the, the case of um, Sue was interesting though. <clears throat> because when she was in Chicago working for the Newberry Library, there's a, a park there called Washington Square Li uh, Park. They also call it Bug House Park. And a lot of people, like radicals and different politicals, would you know literally stand in a soapbox and, and talk about politics. And I, I'm just wondering, did that affect Sue at all when she was going back and forth from work? I have no idea. But she did become one of the very important leaders um, representing Manzanar. And <clears throat> these all these individuals all helped in various ways to make redress and reparations a reality. John Tatiishi with the JACL. Um, Alan Nishio, he was again, one of the babies born in camp in, uh, on August, in August 1945. He didn't, Alan didn't realize that he was born in a concentration camp until he was uh, at UC Berkeley. And um, his family never really talked about it. He thought he was born in a labor camp. Um, and I think that's, that touches upon a theme that comes out later in the book, that um, many of the sub, like especially the Issei, the first generation, um, or maybe even the Nisei, didn't really talk about what had happened to them um, during World War II to their descendants, to their children or their grandchildren, um, especially before 1980. Um, there was, a, 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 in some cases, a sense of maybe shame, communal shame, because Why did the government do this? Did we do something wrong? Another thing is people were just trying to survive. Um, I think, like in the case of Alan Nishio, his father had a grocery store. He was very proud of it before World War II. Um, after the war, he became a gardener. One out of 10 men in Los Angeles County became gardeners, at least for a short time. Um, so he And he was ne never able to get that grocery business again. And I think, you know, he mourned that. So I think definitely for a, a lot of the, especially the older folks who couldn't really reclaim their lives um, after the war, um, it was just something they didn't want to talk about. Um, Aiko uh, Yoshi, um, Herzig, um, Yoshinaga at the top, um, she you know, moved around in a lot of different places. She was in LA, she was in New York here. This photo's in New York, and she became involved with the activist women's group called AAA, and they were heavily influenced by the Black Power movement. And 
I co found herself like on the front lines of like marches through Manhattan. And later she would go to Washington, D.C. with her husband. And, you know, she was the one at National Archives and finding these crucial pieces of evidence that showed that the government indeed had suppressed um, even, uh, information, you know, that allowed for the incarceration of Japanese Americans. So she was, she's very important. And then we have William Horry, who was in LA, then Chicago. Um, and he oh, was, he was at the forefront of um, the um, movement to take the cases to the Supreme Court and uh, to take this, the incarceration um, to be examined by the Supreme Court and overturned. And unfortunately, um, he came close, but it never really happened. And Heather and I were just discussing this right before that he was a visionary because in terms of what things that are happening today, you know, I think people are, are kind of citing the quote internment cases and saying that it's it's a possibility that yeah. So even though the cases have been vacated in the case of Hirabayashi and, and Korematsu, and they weren't, the the charge was vacated, but the ruling wasn't actually overturned. So he was right. I think, you know, we have, and even though one of the dissenting justices at the time said, this is lying around like a loaded gun, here we are where the precedent does actually still stand, which is devastating even say those words. That was another thing. Um, and, and John Tateishi, in one of his interviews, he, because they would talk, you know, with other, you know, he was a child in camp, and after camp, he would talk to the other kids. And he said Manzanar was one of the cool camps, in, in the sense, <laughs> a lot a happened there. That, yeah, yeah. yeah was, so maybe that kind of affected the incarcerees as well. There was well. this pecking order. Of, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so... And another part of this, the book was also links to the next generation. This is a photo where the, uh, the Kiriyama, the matriarch of the Kiriyama family was one of the early ones to re, uh, receive a, her redress check. And, um, and in the same photo is her granddaughter, Tracy Kato Kiriyama, and who's a poet, and um, she'll come up later in our presentation. But um, so, it was very interesting to see how Manzanar not only is part of the people who were there at that time, but also the story of the people who came later. I think that idea of intergenerational um, influence um, we were really interested in, and it certainly comes up in the story of the Banai family. We were just talking a little bit about the four Supreme Court cases that were filed during the war, and then the quorum nobis cases, which sought to overturn those are the, the convictions. Um, so in this photo, we have uh, Lorraine, who looks really incredibly youthful, and her sister Catherine is working on a companion case up in Seattle for Gordon Hirabayashi. And so here's um, Fred Korematsu here, and of course their father is Naomi Mitchell's Paul Banai, who became the first Japanese American assemblyman in California. So this idea that the work uh, continues through generations, I think that was that was one aspect that um, we really wanted to reveal in the book. We, as Naomi mentioned, you know what's what's Manzanar like today, and in, in many ways the genesis of this book was to help people who go there, many of whom don't have a personal or family connection to the site. And their main question is what, what happened afterward? And we wanted to take a look at the stories of people who were, who's, who were personally at Manzanar or whose families were, were connected with Manzanar and the various ways in which it seemed like somehow there was a need, there was a pull to go back to Manzanar and experience it in a new way and experience it with multiple generations. So we spend a little bit of time in the book in the epilogue talking about the varied reasons um, why, why one might go back to Manzanar. Um, Henry Fukuhara, from before the visitor center was completed in 98 till after it was completed through, I think, about 2008, he led a series of outdoor plein air watercolor studios. 
And um, it was one way that he could pass on his expertise as an artist, but also connect to the site, bring other people there. And then of course the artwork itself was shared with, with larger audiences. And for many people, it was cathartic. And as Naomi said, their families hadn't spoken about it. Um, so this was a way for them to kind of re-examine that story in their family. Um, Saburo so Sasaki, um, here he is, he was about seven when he was at Manzanar. He and his wife, Anne, return every month since they've been doing so since 2004. He, they work as docents. They engage groups of school kids. Here he is in the mess hall. Eileen and I worked on the mess hall exhibits <laughs> together. Um, but Saburo, he... Um, decided he had to start telling his wartime story during the Gulf War when he saw what his Arab American colleagues were going through. He saw what, what they were experiencing, the fear, the fear mongering. And that was the first time he decided he, he had a story to tell. So he um, decided at that point to, to return to Manzanar and share his story with visitors so that he can encourage um, deeper understanding of what we've done in the past and, and how can we make sure we don't do it again. Um, Dave Goto is the grandnephew of James Goto, who is the doctor at, at Manzanar, and then I think, was it Topaz? Um, anyway, Manzanar certainly. And Dave um, is a certified arborist and he works at, at Manzanar. He's also doing this incredible work. They've been doing this community archeology span with the gardens and he's, helping construct some of the original features in ways that would be authentic to the time. Um, he actually took a, he received a grant um, to go to Sendai, Japan after the Fukushima disaster and help rebuild a memorial garden. And while he was there, he learned some techniques that would have been used in Manzanar in the 40s. So um, he's, he's contributing a lot to the, the site as it's um, sort of evolving today. So this is um, one of our last slides. Um, and again, it continues. Um, Sean Mira is the grandson of um, Paul Banai and the son of, of Catherine Banai. And here he's participating in the Women's March last year. And he, he chose to use No More Manzanar, uh, evoke the name of Manzanar in his uh, placard there. And that's right now it's, um, being um, archived at the Smithsonian. And um, I met, uh, we saw Tracy in the other image with her grandmother receiving the redress check. And Tracy is a very active poet and actually one, and she writes a lot about justice issues and what her parents and grandparents had gone through during World War II. And we included one of her poems in our book as well. Just wanted to end with oh, okay. Momo's, yeah. Momo's tapestry. Um, so this is Momo Nagano's tapestry on display here at Janum. And we just wanted to acknowledge also the incredible collection, obviously, of Janum. And we tapped into it for numerous photographs and incredible assistance here. And um, Momo is kind of one of the guiding spirits, in a way, of our project, too. Um, but yeah, that's, that's so the thank formal you. part. <laughs> So um, Liz is going to be passing the mic around for any of you who, if you have comments, especially Toyo, if you want, maybe we should start off with Toyo yeah. to say, you know, anything she wants to say, kind of related to this topic, though. Or, or Seabrook. Or, <laughs> so yeah. she's right there. Before and, we go into that yeah. real quick, I did want to mention, because you did bring up Momo Nagano, her uh, work is actually hanging right outside this oh, lobby. Oh, yeah, one of her we, weaving pieces. So oh, um, so it, once you're done, once we're done here, please do go outside, and there is a little information plaque sitting on that desk, so you can read more about her work, and it's oh, kind of perfect timing. Oh, okay, so. That's great. Yeah. Um, um, so wave your hand, <laughs> Toyo, and you want to say anything about your the I know you're so young but um, at that time so yes well I was two I was two when uh, we went to Manzanar so I don't really have too many personal um, memories uh, of my I think it's about three years there 
Mm -hmm. um, but um, I saw your little um, item on Seabrook, yeah. and I do remember a lot about Seabrook. In fact, I know the uh, twins. Oh, you do. I went to. I went to. <laughs> they were in my class. That makes sense. In elementary yeah. school. Yeah. So oh. I want oh. to great. try to find out further from you about how I can, how I can uh, connect with them. Oh, I, I, I do know how to do that. <laughs> well, at least by, by snail mail. Yeah. Uh -huh. They helped provide that photograph. That Buick was um, their dad's prized possession. It was like, you know, oh. used Buick bought after the war. Oh, this is, uh -huh. that's really interesting. Yeah, they stayed so in. So I was there from uh, about five to about the sixth grade. And then we came back. We're, I think that mic is kind of yeah. going in and out. I don't know. Do you think it's, that's the whole issue? All right. Maybe hold it like I was about five, yeah. and uh, uh, we left Seabrook uh, when I was uh, in the sixth grade, starting the sixth grade. So, um, Do you have any specific memories about Seabrook? Yes, I have a lot of memories about Seabrook. Um, the community uh, that I was... Uh, well, it's mostly Japanese community. Can't remember how many families there were, but very close knit. It's almost like an extension of uh, Manzanar. And um, we had a Buddhist church, Christian church. Um, I went to Japanese school. And um, um, all my friends were Japanese, although the school itself was integrated with um, students from the neighboring community. Um, yeah. Uh, well, just those, that, just a little item on Seabrook brings mm -hmm. back a lot. Was there any yeah. smells that you remember? I don't know when, I guess it's not going to smell like fish, but when I did the book on Terminal <laughs> Island, the smell of the fish was very pungent. <laughs> so. Well, you know, we were surrounded by uh, farms, yeah. um, mostly um, vegetables, corn, green beans, and in fact, um, the uh, uh, kids all used to, in the summertime, uh, go to pick, pick vegetables oh. to earn money. You know. uh, my sister is like 10 years older than I, and she was in high school, and so I'm, I remember. So you, you eat fresh vegetables, right? You didn't eat frozen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm afraid a lot of it was frozen. <laughs> But, but, yeah, um, well, he wasn't really a mayor, but that's what we called him. He kind of led the community. Uh -huh. So, um, I don't know what to say about that. Well, um, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, I know, I know Manzanar would love to do an oral history with you. I know I've said this before, but I'm just going to really embarrass you and say it in front of everybody else. <laughs> well, I, I just remember what my parents told me about Manzanar. Yeah. But, but I, I remember more about Seabrook. That, that's I, a big I, part I, of this. I mean, that's yeah. a big part of the story, too. Yeah. 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 Do you remember the, what the, the housing was like? Like, it seemed like they were cinder block and very, very kind of... Very similar to, I think, the Manzanar. Um, yeah. Um, long row apartments. Yeah. And um, I remember that we had... Um, our heating was one of those pot belly stoves and they delivered coal to us and we had like yeah. bins of coal yeah. um, in front of each apartment. And, um, yeah. Um, That's what Irene and Pauline's dad, Charles, is. it's kind of, was awfully reminiscent really of the barracks. Like originally they had uh -huh. to kind of set up, you know, it's kind of pretty, pretty bare bones housing. Yeah. Yeah. And then there were other, um, after a few years, were other groups. Oh, there were a lot of uh, Japanese who came from Peru. Oh, yes, yes, the Japanese province. Yeah. yeah. So do you do you and remember that at the time? They were from Crystal City. Someone mentioned uh -huh. that they were from Crystal City, and then they relocated. Oh, mm -hmm. they re. I'm sorry. They relocated uh, to New Jersey, mm -hmm. and Estonians. I remember Estonians. I had a lot of friends that were from Estonia, and. Um, and a lot of black families from the South would come, they were, I guess, migrant, mm -hmm. uh, to come and pick uh, vegetables, uh, pick, uh, do the picking in the, uh, 
in the surrounding area. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm. well, everybody worked at the plant, everybody that was living there. And I think they got some kind of uh, help on the rent. Or they got free rent. I don't remember. It was, it was so. kind of like a company. It was, it was a company. It was a, it was a company. company rent. town. It was really. a rent. Town. Yeah, subsidized. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, yeah. Uh, and the and the um, like. My mother was on a a line, and so, you know, when the season was over, nobody worked. Oh, that's interesting. And then interesting. they were on. Um, uh, anyway, they didn't work for like four four months. Huh. So. Uh, so they that wouldn't repurpose the socializing them time. Else. For, huh, for that's the interesting. Community. Yeah, I didn't know that. And they had all the you know Japanese uh, festivals and things like that. So. You were at Seabrook. I, yeah, I visited Seabrook. They have an yeah. educational center there. Yeah, I'm and sure I, it's a lot different now. Yeah, they do have a Buddhist temple, but yeah. of course it's not. Well, when I visited, the priest was not. Japanese of oh, Japanese wow. descent, but their big fundraiser was the Chow Men dinner. <laughs> oh, really? Like everywhere else. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Toyo. Oh, yeah. You're Thank you. Any questions or comments? We have one here. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. What? Can you give us your name? Uh, I'm David Eto. Okay. My father was a preacher there. Was he Mamoru Eto? Yeah. Okay. That's my father. So San Luis Obispo. No? Yeah, Pas uh, Pasadena. Pasadena? Yeah. Oh, okay. And L.A. Okay. Yeah. So I just, I just want to make contact with him. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, are we doing a matchmaking service? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Toyo, you know that. Mr. Eto wants to talk to you afterwards, okay? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Any other uh, comments or questions? Okay, oh, hold on one second. My voice is loud enough, so you don't need to. No. Uh, well, well, this is a little trivial question, but you know, you alluded in the beginning that in 1942, that some of the people that were in the intern camps were released. Is it because of medical reasons, or was there other reasons besides that? How were they released? So students, uh, well, students primarily were the first to be able to why? get an individual leave clearance. Uh, why? Uh, yes. So the um, Japanese American Friends Resettlement Association, there, there was a number of groups who were actually advocating for students to be able to continue their education. and. The WRA very quickly, the War Relocation Authority really realized this is, first of all, it's, un well, I won't go on and on. It was un unsustainable, untenable. So it was in the WRA's interest to begin to encourage resettlement. And so in a way, the students and kind of the younger generation, I think kind of bore the burden a little bit. We talk about Chiko Sakaguchi, who was, I think, out in 42 or 43, you know, went on her own to Philadelphia and um, unfortunately died. But um, so starting in really fall 42, and then it picks up the pace after, um, after the leave clearance process is somewhat resolved through the incredibly controversial loyalty questionnaire. So th th it was unsustainable, essentially. I, I, the government wanted P uh, Japanese Americans to kind of disappear and, uh, quote, assimilate mm -hmm. in other parts of the U.S., and that's why they were saying don't bunch up, you know, in groups. But of course, you know, if you've your house has been removed, you're in camp, and then, you know, the, who are you going to trust? You're going to maybe trust your community. So that's and and you want to go back home. You don't want to live yeah. in the Midwest yeah. because you you didn't want to live there. You were forced to. So people wanted to go back home to California, you know, eventually. But so there had there were. There's also temporary workers, right? The, the, the Butte for Lowe's, well, that whole summer, who was going to work on the, you know, bring in the farm harvest? So really starting that summer of 42, mostly men are, again, sort of individually cleared to go work on the Butte harvest in Idaho and Oregon. But, but it was, you know, Issei couldn't leave, you know, the first right. generation. 
you know, the immigrants who could not even become citizens, naturalized citizens if they wanted to. That didn't happen until 1952 for the, for, you know, the Japanese immigrants. You could not become a citizen. Whereas if you were from, you know, uh, Germany or, you know, yeah. other kind of Europe, white European places, you could become. Why is that? It was racism. It was racism. Yeah. You know? I mean, racism is unfortunately baked into our constitution. It's actually sort of a spinoff of slavery horribly. So we had to decide, okay, well, what's white and then what's non-white and in 1921, there was a Supreme Court case that said, oh, sorry, people, Japanese Americans, you actually aren't considered non-white. So it was really horrifying. So, so then it took from 1921 to 1952. So there was, there was never a case where, you know, Japanese stood up and said, why me? Or there's no, never a case like that? Um, you mean in I terms mean, of resisting? Right, well, that, protesting, you know, because of the fact that, I mean, not until 1952, 52, you're, you're saying that uh, first generation, you know, Japanese could not be citizens. Weren't there any cases where people fought? Yes. I mean, that 1921 case was a Supreme Court case. Oh, a guy named case? George Shima said, hey, this oh. is crazy. Uh -huh. um, I need to be able to become a citizen. And, and it was, it wasn't withheld. So, Yes. To then kind of. Re yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there were a number of uh, legal cases, and um, many, you know, were challenging the um, anti Asian land laws here in Los Angeles and Riverside. I guess, Kristen, are you still here? I don't know where Kristen Hayashi's here. Um, you know, maybe you could. Talk a little bit about the Japanese hospital case be, um, that was in Boyle Heights, or anything else you want to add? <laughs> yes. Oh, well, I was thinking just another court case would be Ozawa versus the United States, right? We're challenging that notion of whiteness uh, to become a citizen. But yeah, it's this long history of discriminatory legislation against Japanese and other Asian um, groups, right, in the United States. So the incarceration was just a continuation of that long legacy of discriminatory legislation. Um, the, yeah, the, the Japanese hospital here in Boyle Heights, I've, I've done some research on, on that case, but it was five Issei doctors um, were just trying to establish better facilities for the Japanese American community that was growing here in Los Angeles um, because of the 1918 influenza epidemic and because of discrimination um, from uh, more mainstream hospitals, Japanese and other ethnic minorities were often turned away from getting um, health care. And so when these five immigrant uh, doctors tried to incorporate the hospital, they were denied by the California Secretary of State in 1926, saying that they violated the alien land law. Mm -hmm. um, and they fought it. They fought it to the U.S. Supreme Court. First, the California State Supreme Court ruled in favor of the doctors. And of course, the Secretary of State in California challenged it. So it went to the U.S. Supreme Court court um, and the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the lower court's ruling and the doctors were able to build the hospital, which is still um, extant. It's on First Street um, in Fickett in Boyle Heights, and it's now um, a local historic cultural monument because of this important story that it tells. Yeah, I think there's numerous cases of people pushing back and protesting, filing lawsuits, going to Sacramento. I did a book on Terminal Island, too, and there was constantly being um, uh, regulations to prohibit Japanese from being commercial fishermen. So they always had to lobby, you know, Sacramento every year. Any other questions? I'm going to do here, here. Oh, this is Kristen, our collections manager here at Janum. Well, I just want to say, Heather and, and Naomi Bravo, this is a really um, important book, right, that, that is getting at this um, topic of resettlement, which is woefully understudied. So thank you for your contributions. And after I read it, I was thinking 
that, you know, these personal narratives are so rich and um, they make the history really accessible. And it sounds like that was your goal. And I think you really accomplished it. I'm just wondering how you found individuals like Toyo and um, so many of the other people that you feature in your book. You're able to follow them for um, a long time. And through my research, I'm finding a lot of names, especially of women, that I want to follow. But these are through WRA records, and I'm just not sure how to make these connections so many years later. So mm -hmm. if you could just kind of talk about how you found um, some of the subjects of your research. Um, well, actually, right now we need to acknowledge Jim Howell, who's mentioned in the dedication. And unfortunately, he died before the book came out. Um, he was a volunteer ranger at Manzanar and also Tule Lake. In his day job, he was a, a lawyer for the SEC. So he was the most dogged, tenacious, amazing researcher. So he built up um, sort of a... a I guess a sort of low tech database for us. More than once, we had to use Ancestry.com, which was which was interesting, especially when the WRA records are sort of dodgy or wrong. Um, Ancestry.com was an incredible tool, and Naomi's. I'll just give her a shout out. She's an Ancestry.com wizard, mm -hmm. um, so that helped us out numerous times. And then. Um, it, for me, it was a combination of looking at the roster, um, then finding newspapers, kind of then going to secondary sources, and then Jim, in some cases, obituaries, kind of working both ends against the middle, sort of the roster to obituaries, and then trying to find a descendant, and then interview the descendant. That's probably the short answer to, to yeah, how things work. Yeah, I think worked. what you're doing is incredibly tough. I mean, we kind of knew beforehand who we were going to follow, and some of that was based on the fact that there was material. So yes. we made a conscious yeah. decision. Um, I'm trying to think if there are cases of people we just kind well, the, of found a dead end. I'm not sure. Oh, a dead end? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things I wanted to do was, was take more photographs and say what happened to this person and sort of base it around a, a, a photograph from the 40s and 50s, and we definitely ran into dead ends that way, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but sometimes it worked. Like Mary, Mary and Charles Nagao, we kind of built out from just knowing of their story at Manzanar. Originally. You know, what's tough, too, is the time. You know, I worked at the Rafa Shimpo in 1980s, 1990s. And at that time, you could put a letter in the, you know, to the editor. And I'm looking for this person. And I mm -hmm. think in Karen Ishizuka's book, um, Lost and Found, one of her books, um, she has a clipping of a white woman who is looking for her Japanese-American friend. And we actually put that in Raf Shimpo and someone responded, you know, the photograph. Mm -hmm. But it's so different now, you know, so that is more challenging for you. Um, so, yeah, so good luck. <laughs> uh, I attended some of the hearings before Menzenar became a men Menzenar. And some of the comments that were made during those hearings was like, this is not American history. This is Japanese history. Okay? And here I'm sitting down and I'm saying, what, what is this? Okay? And one another comment that was really made up there was that when they take the equipment out of that auditorium there, they're going to burn it down. This is the kind of atmosphere that was before Manzanar became Manzanar. It was yeah. very emotional, right? Yes. You know, and I, I think uh, John Tateishi, he mentions that in his oral histories because he was in charge of getting a lot of people to testify. And that was the first time he ever saw like Nisei men like cry. And he would go off somewhere and cry himself, you know. So I think we have this stereotype of the stoic, you know, Japanese American man you know, whatever, and and I think so many things were repressed, you know, suppressed and repressed and kind of came out during those hearings. I, I wish I was a little, I could, I was in college when the, the those hearings, you know, um, were happening and I wish I had attended. Hi, <laughs> in the hi. middle. Oh, hi. Oh, oh, hi. <laughs> That's kind of right. Um, my question was, the locations that people left from Manzanar seem very, very different. And I wondered if there was some commonality between those locations. My grandfather left to Chicago for school, but he didn't stay there. <laughs> so, Well, it, you know, Chicago was a 
a place that many people went to because it was a big city and they had jobs. So um, that was one of the reasons. Um, the American Friends Service Committee and also the, the Nisei student group that um, Heather mentioned were instrumental in kind of going out there and, and finding communities where yeah. and, and work, right, for for the incarcerees. Yeah, I think it was, where is a labor market where there's also housing? And then for students, that would sort of be another kind of um, destination. And then the, mil the military. So kind of those three chunks um, in terms of the sort of pre end of war resettlement period, that would kind of be the drivers behind that. Is there a school? Is there a job market where there's also housing? And the WRA did do, um, they had actually, I don't know if any of these were wraps photos or what, but there was a, the WRA, the, the photographic service for the WRA was actually actively, you know, promoting certain cities um, and following families. And in fact, the people we were going to put on the cover of our book were the Oshima family and the, the, the photographers followed their journey of finding an apartment in Chicago. It turns out they were from Tule Lake, so they weren't on the cover of our book, but um, another WRA mistake uh, in the, in the caption. Um, so the WRA was was sort of promoting um, essentially certain certain destinations also. Yeah, it feels kind of random though when you look at it. Like, so yeah, it seemed like his family it was they all went to Catholic universities, or that's. You know, that my, and I don't know enough about this, maybe Kristen knows more, that it seemed to me it would be some religious affiliation, also also Quaker. And then in some cases it really was um, uh, Drake University, but Robert Naka just went to University of Missouri. You know, he's yeah. an engineer and they just found a good program that, that, that would fit him. So it seems like maybe the lion's share did have a religious affiliation, but there were certainly some state universities connected with certain individuals whose studies maybe warranted you know, a certain kind of discipline. Um, so I don't know that much about um, the differences between the, the Catholic um, sort of destinations and the Quaker, but those are certainly two that stood out. Um, hi. I just, I guess I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, Japanese American participation with other civil movements and other like, like solidarity with other movements and also, I was interested because I just went through the exhibit, and I there was a one small part of the exhibit that mentioned that Atlanta was actually I'm from Atlanta oh. was actually a spot where um, Japanese Americans resettled. But then I didn't see it on the list of resettlement areas. So I was wondering about also like, mm -hmm. did Japanese was there a lot of resettlement in the South? And I, I believe it was chick sexing, right? That was yes. one of the industries. You know, I think because our focus was narrowly on Manzanar and it was yeah. narrowly on certain people whose stories we could follow. Like, yeah. but um, to be honest, like certain, I noticed that certain geographies, it um, like actually in Chicago, I've, when I was there, mm -hmm. I learned that many people were actually not necessarily from Manzanar, but from Gila River, from Poston, like in, yeah. in this one, um, area of Chicago, they had the Gila Hotel. Oh, really? You know? Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then huh. it, it, you could find this also at looking at different camp newspapers mm -hmm. because they were soliciting, you know, like someone from Chicago, let's say, or maybe even Atlanta from that particular camp, you know, got out and then was um, sending an article like, please come to Atlanta, you know? And that might have just gone to people in Heart Mountain or, you know, so yeah. It, yeah. it's kind of like these weird, uh, uh, you know, even with like works, work like gardening, like if, if you have a pool of people who are doing it and they tell their friends and they start coming and it, it kind of grows. Yeah. It did feel like that kind of serial migration in reverse kind of thing, where yeah. you, somebody has a foothold and then it, it kind of can go from So there, yeah. regarding Atlanta, we just didn't come across yeah. someone. So the, in, as far <laughs> south as we get is, is Missouri with Robert Naka, but I'm yeah. intrigued by the Atlanta one because I just now I think I want to run through the roster and see who went to Atlanta. I don't, 
it didn't come up. I have to be honest with you. That's but interesting. But definitely yeah. in terms of the solidarity, well, I think the uh, civil rights movement and the black power movement, it definitely did touch the lives of especially the Nisei leaders, like William Horry was one. He was involved with the United Methodist Church in Chicago, and there was um, a, a march in the South to support this um, um, civil rights activist, James Meredith. To he, he was kind of prevented from continuing his he got protest. Yeah, shot. He got yeah, wounded. Yeah, and so, yeah. So, um, so, but he went down. And, and and marched and you know he, everyone had like a little American flag and he said he really felt like he was really proud to be an American to join in yeah. but he was afraid at first I think the taxi driver and he had a camera so the taxi driver taking him to the spot he was supposed to join the marchers said what what are you doing here and he said oh I'm going to take photographs you know and he kind of didn't spill the beans that he was actually a participant so but I think he like grew into that role and like I mentioned with um uh, Aiko Hertz of Yoshinaga, you know, it was definitely um, those women, in, and and they included um, all the um, the other, you know, civil rights feminists in in the New York area. They were definitely influenced by um, the African American uh, leaders and in marchers and protesters and they I think they kind of learned more mm -hmm. you know and they were inspired and they kind of saw parallels to what the, the African Americans were struggling with to what had happened to them during World War II to see some commonalities yeah and, yeah so definitely so we're going to do three more questions we'll do here here and then back to the other side hi there um, I was wondering if you could speak to um, what you had mentioned regarding the WRA not wanting Japanese Americans to, uh, af during resettlement, to be grouped together, um, especially in light of the trailer parks that were set up in Burbank by the WRA. It seems to be like a contradiction, right, of mm -hmm. JAs together but not wanting them to be together. Um, there okay. were many contradictions. And in fact, uh, Dylan Meyer, who was the head of the WRA, he became the head of like public housing in Los Angeles. So he had his hand in both places. Mm -hmm. So like you said, a lot of it didn't make sense. And, you know, I, I think like they wanted the Japanese Americans to kind of just kind of, you know, we use this word today, kind of be erased in a way, kind of disappear. And, you know, they're, they're, they're really, wasn't a way f for them to do that because people were going to hang out with people that they trusted. I don't know what. No, I think that's right. I think the goal of assimilation, um, essentially, which was explicitly stated as a goal, I think it was just um, impossible to to really enforce. And, and um, you're right. There, there are lots of contradictions. And in fact, when you got into some of the documentation about. Um, you know, there was some resistance locally to the the trailer parks and sort of that concentration. And if anything, then they kind of had to do some, you know, reverse PR saying it's going to be okay and they won't be here very long and we'll make sure the trailer parks are, you know, it's transitional. So um, I think the contradictions are sort of just part and parcel of the calamity that the government engaged the, the in. The Japanese problem. <laughs> yeah. The problem of the Japanese. Yeah. It's yeah. a good question, though. Hi. Um, just as a point of information, um, my family was interned in Poston, mm -hmm. and my father left before the war, the war ended because he was allowed to go to Chicago because no one could return to the West Coast at that time. Mm -hmm. So then my family followed, and then I was born in 49, or 46, I'm sorry, and we left in 49 and returned to L.A. Um, but I wanted to... Um, tell you about an ironic piece of news I got this morning from a friend who um, actually was interned in Rower, Arkansas, and apparently the feds are looking at Rower, Arkansas for a camp for the migrants. And it'll, it'll be a tent camp. Yep. 
I know. So this oh. this story unfortunately continues, right? Mm. You know, um, yeah, I, I had seen that as well. The, the rower location? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Is there, there's a military base there? There's, or somehow? Yeah, oh, there's some kind of goodness. base. Yeah. Um, I'm a member of, of St. Mary's Episcopal Church, and the bishop at, at the time of the war was very sympathetic to our church because it was a mission uh, for the Japanese. So we were the, a point of congregation and a point of going, and the majority of the members went to Manzadar, and um, the, the Miyataki family, um, a few of the, their, their children are members of our church. And... Um, what I what um, the what what I re was really um, interesting to me because I'm from Hawaii. I knew nothing about the internment of the Japanese here, mm -hmm. um, let alone those in Japan in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And so you know there there were the Isseis that were um, in internment camps in Hawaii also. But I, the, the interesting part of uh, Manzadar is our church d does do pilgrimages there because of the, the family connections. And um, it, it, it's uh, amazing how the Episcopal Church has always supported the Japanese uh, in Los Angeles. And we were significant in, in doing it nationally. So the, the United States has an Asian Episcopal ministry that is all over the United States. I, I love visiting um, St. Mary's Episcopal Church. Nowhere else that I know of can you go see stained glass, and it has um, the 10 camps on it. Oh, wow. Um, and they also have, I mean, I know it sounds like awful, but it, I think it's in reverence and um, in respect of where mm -hmm. people were. I mean, there's also levity. There's one with, I think, um, Reverend Yamazaki loves Snoopy, right? And Snoopy's on the... <laughs> there, there was a, a, a very strong member um, whose son was, uh, had, had cancer very early, and he liked Snoopy. So Father John made sure that we had Snoopy on the uh, stained glass that the family donated to the church. Oh. Yeah. And there's also, for, for me, the daughter of a gardener, there's a push mower... There's a fish for Terminal Islander fishermen. There's like flowers, right? Flower grows. So really in honor of the Issei and other produce for the, the farmers. So yeah, you should really check out that church. It's very cool. It's in Koreatown now. It used to be called Uptown. Oh, Uptown. That neighborhood. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I need to go there. It's yeah. Is that um, driving range still there, golf? No. Oh, okay. Um, there's one, there were two there. Oh, okay. And, but now it's ch changing to big commercial buildings. Yeah, oh, gentrification. And our church, you know, decided before when J-Town, Little Tokyo was developing, um, we looked at, my, my husband was a senior warden, and we looked at property here, but we couldn't match what we had there. So that's why the church is still there. Oh, wow. But, you know, it's... Um, I welcome you all to come and visit us. <laughs> it's on Olympic and Normandy, and you know the stain, there, there's a booklet that we pass out to people who want to know about the stained glass windows. So that's oh, your thank incentive. You. <laughs> thank you. It's great. Is that it? You think? Yes. So okay. that is all for our questions this afternoon. Please um, join me in thanking Naomi and Heather for this wonderful presentation. Thank you.